I'm Kelly Hamby. I'm an associate professor in the entomology department. Today I'm going to talk to you about spotted wing drosophila biological control and about spotted lanternfly, something that is on, on the horizon for many of us. So really quickly, I want to start with this spotted wing drosophila life cycle. Many of you have probably already been dealing with spotted wing for many years. It was an invasive pest native to Southeast Asia that's come in. But one of the reasons I think it's really helpful to start with the life cycle is because that really highlights where we have places that we can do control. So again, they lay their eggs directly into fresh fruit. That's why they're a pest. Usually they do leave their little breathing tubes out of the fruit. So here's just an example of their eggs inside a cherry. Depending on the temperature, it takes 12 to 72 two hours before that hatches. Then the larvae are living inside the fruit. This inside the fruit time period of their life cycle makes it very hard for you to do any control because some of the insecticides will penetrate a little bit, but there's not that much else that we can do to manage them in this nice natural habitat that they have. It's kind of got a mitigating influence of having the moisture they need, the temperatures they need. Then at about five to seven days it takes before they pupate, which they may pupate in the fruit or they may drop out of the fruit and pupate in the ground. And then they spend most of their life outside the fruit they, as an adult. Um, and that can take, the pup pupation can take four to 15 days depending on temperature. And then the adults can live for over a month depending on the time of the year. Um, so really we have this narrow window of adult, uh, of adult activity to kill them while they're outside the fruit or to do something about them while they're outside of the fruit. And they have a very quick generation time. So the other reason I want to bring this up is to contrast this with the spotted lanternfly, which we'll get to later, which has a much longer life cycle than spotted wing drosophila. And this is one of the things that makes it such a bad fruit pest is because they can go through generations really quickly and the populations can build up really fast. In terms of spotted wing drosophila integrated pest management, we have a, a, a lot of options in our toolbox, starting with prevention and avoidance, then monitoring and risk assessment, Manage all of the management and interventions from chemical, cultural, and biological, as well as some post-harvest mitigation. I've given many talks on this in the past, so I'm not going to spend much time on that. What I really want to talk about today is the advancements that we've made in biological control. But if you have any questions on management, please feel free to ask me. In terms of the biological control options for spotted wing drosophila, we've tried a lot of different potential options for biological control. So this is using other organisms against spotted wing drosophila, whether it be nematodes and fungi, or other insects and arthropods, or even birds, other things that are going to be eating spotted wing drosophila. So people have been doing a lot of different research over the years that we've had spotted wing drosophila to look at some of these. And let's walk through them. In terms of using entoma pathogens, so pathogens that kill insects, so these are fungi and nematodes that are actually attacking insects and get into them inside the fruit. Some of the things that people have looked at are being able to spray them directly on the crop, see if you can infest the spotted wing drosophila. We've also looked at looking, putting them in the soil to try to get those pupae as they drop out. And then they've also looked at using a, a bait to bring the flies in to get spores on their body and then leave and distribute it through their crop. All of these things had some promise, but they were rather expensive. So there hasn't really been much movement on commercializing them, um, and we need further work to really ensure that there's field efficacy. So there are, there's continuing research on this in this area, but there aren't currently any products that use this approach. The other thing we can do is we can preserve naturally occurring predators, things that are already out there, the good bugs that are already out there in your fields. So we do know there's a lot of different predators that will consume spotted wing drosophila adults, their larvae, and their pupae. But the thing is that when, if we're out there controlling spotted wing drosophila with insecticides, we're going to be knocking out those beneficial predators. So this is really a, a strategy that's going to work with, well in low input systems um, where you're not using insecticides. And we've also found that though there is things out there eating them, where they're not eating enough of them to really reduce the damage sufficiently for marketing these fruit. The other type of natural enemy that's really 
a great biological control agent for insects is something we call parasitoids. These are typically wasps, although there are other types of organisms, some flies, that will have a parasitic lifestyle like this. And what that means is they're coming in and they're laying their eggs directly in the insect, and then their larvae develop within them and kill them. Because they have that such close relationship with the life cycle of the insect, they're really good at finding them. They can get to them inside the fruit. And so this is why parasitoids are one of those natural enemies that we really like to use for biological control. We have some native wasps that do feed on Drosophila. Unfortunately, Drosophila and Drosophila has a really good immune system, better than other Drosophila species. So what you see here, is a wasp has laid an egg in this one, it was a larva, and the wasp, the fly was able to encapsulate that egg and suffocate it with melanin. So it leaves a little black spot. So this fly has killed two wasp eggs successfully and it's out there doing fine. Um, so spotted wasp has a good immune system. Our resident wasps aren't gonna be enough. And they're also, again, not compatible with insecticides. So, what we really thought was important was to go back to where spotted wing Drosophila is native and see if we could find other wasp species that are gonna be a little bit better, a little bit better evolved to, to beat spotted wing Drosophila's immune system. So we had a lot of biological control experts. They went to China, Japan, South Korea. They went looking for spotted wing Drosophila out in its native habitat. They were looking at some wild rubus species in Asia, Frigerius with strawberries and Sampuca, so elderberries. And that's where they got most of these wasps out of spotted wing Drosophila infesting those native plants. So if you look at this, this is the percentage of the parasitoids that were reared out. that were these different species of wasp. So Gnaspis brasiliensis was very common. The next most common was Leptopolina japonica. With, in terms of how many of those flies had been parasitized, about 20% in the rubus and strawberries, and over 60% in the elderberries. So we're thinking we could get possibly up to 60% parasitism in a natural system. Mm -hmm. And again, this is an area where you're not using insecticides. This is out in the forest in Southeast Asia. So they brought those wasps back to the United States into quarantine facilities where they did a bunch of tests to see is there going to be any non-target impacts of using these wasps in the United States. One of the major things they wanted to do is check for their specificity. So that's a big part of whether they're going to have non-target effects. Are they going to kill other flies? Are they going to kill other Drosophila species? So here's their success. These are all Drosophila species. Here's the, whether the wasp was successfully able to parasitize and then emerge out of them. So this species, Astobara japonica, attacked a lot of different fly species. So that was not a good target. Leptopolina japonica, less so. It's a little bit more specific. Here's the ones that are closely related to Drosophila suzuki and Drosophila suzuki. But it also had some that were a little bit more distantly related to than that it was able to be successful with. So Gnaspis brasiliensis is the one that was selected because it had this high host specificity that should increase its chances of being good at finding spotted wing Drosophila and also reduce its chances of having non-target impacts. So this is the wasp that they decided to move forward with. So in 2021, they, they, after a series, they petitioned actually for releases five years before this and got some feedback that they needed to do more tests. So then they did more tests. In 2021, they had a successful p petition that enabled a permit for release in 2022 in all of these states. So we started being able to release Gnaspis brasiliensis in 2022. So the goal for this then was first they had to establish regional insectaries that are gonna rear enough wasps that we can release them. So the first key people who were working on this were the De Delaware Beneficial Insects and Introduction, in Introduction and Research Unit um, over in Newark, Delaware, and also another lab in California. So they are the very original quarantine populations. They started building their populations up more, and then they started to share them with other states who are also building their populations up and then distributing them out for releases. 
in terms of how we're doing these releases, our goal is really to get them established and able to be successful. So we're targeting areas where we wouldn't expect insecticides to be used. These are natural areas, non-crop areas that have non-crop hosts that spotted when Drosophila use. So we're really trying to release them in the woods near filled edges. We want to get self-sustaining wasp populations that are going to be out there finding spotted wing Drosophila. So in 2022, how do we do these releases in Maryland? We partnered with that beneficial insects unit in, in Del Newark, Delaware. They reared all of our wasps for us and then they mailed them to us. So they provided almost 4,000 wasps. They also helped us with wasp identification and provided lots of advice about how to go about trying to be successful with this project. What we did is we released Ganaspis brasiliensis in non-crop areas at Wimrec and two diversified fruit farms throughout uh, central Maryland. So we put 500 wasps a site in August and September. So this is a tube of 250 wasps. So you can also see they're super small and they're dispersing out of that tube and going to find spotted wing Drosophila. So we put two tubes per site in August and September, and then we only had one tube per site in October because of the limited availability of wasps. But this is what we did in terms of releasing. Then we wanted to make sure that the wasps were out and establishing, so we started collecting fruit to try to recover the wasps. Um, so we collected between 40 and 100 grams of fruit in crop and non, and we collected in crop and non-crop fruit because we really were looking for spotted wing Drosophila to see if those spotted wing Drosophila were parasitized. So we did this at six to eight sites per location. So this is just a picture of, of Wimrec, the two release points, and all of the different kinds of um, fruits that we were collecting and places that we were collecting them from. So we always collected one week after we released. And then we also collected the day that we released in September since that was the second release. We brought that fruit back to the lab. We reared all of the pupae out of the fruit. And then we pulled those pupae out so we could see um, whether a wasp or a fly emerged. So looking at the pupae, you can see if a fly emerged, a fly actually blows up this balloon on the front of its head. And that's how it pops out of a pupa. So it has this little fold that it's expecting to pop off and it leaves this really nice clean hole when a fly emerges from its pupil case. We largely found spotted wing Drosophila flies in the fruit, and occasionally we found some African fig flies. In terms of the wasps, the wasps actually chew a hole out of the fruit, out of the pupa. So they have a very distinctive shell when they get free. Um, and we found both Ganaspis brasiliensis, the wasp we released, as well as Leptopolina japonica, so I'll get back to how did we find this other wasp in a minute. This is the number of organisms per gram fruit. It goes from zero to two and a half. So in blue, I have the wasps that were emerging. And in orange, we have the flies at the three different locations over time. So what you can see is we got a lot more spotted wing Drosophila in September through October. Um, and the wasps are also increasing over time from August through September with less recovery in October. So we got some cooler weather in October and the wasps actually go into an overwintering behavior. So it's possible that it had already been cool enough that they were overwintering and they weren't gonna be em emerging. But we did see an increasing number of wasps at all the sites as we moved through time. In terms of which specific sites well, we were finding wasps at and what, what types of fruits we were finding them in, this is the two diversified fruit farms, both of which were managing spotted wing Drosophila in other ways as well. Um, in the non-crop hosts, we did find higher rates of parasitism. 75% of the pupae were parasitized, but that was only 12 wasps because we only collected blackberry, wild blackberries once, but they were in wild blackberries quite a bit. Some in poke, but not as much in poke, um, and some in honeysuckle. In terms of the crops, we did find at one site 30% of the pupae were parasitized. And that was about 500 wasps that emerged. At the other one, we found less parasitism in the crops. There was blackberries and raspberries. Um, about 100 wasps from the raspberries, which is about 11% of the total pupae we found. 
and three wasps in the blackberries, which was about 7% of the pupae. We also did sample raspberries more heavily because they were, it was kind of at the tail end of blackberry season when we started this project. At Wimrec, which is a totally unsprayed situation, for our non-crop hosts there, we found 11 wasps in autumn olive. It's about 15% of the pupae. Um, and we found two wasps and honeysuckle fruit, which is about 17% of the pupae. But we really found a lot in the crop. We were pretty happy with the parasitism rates that we were finding in the crop. We had almost three, uh, 260 wasps from raspberries and 270 wasps from blackberries, which was 30% and almost 40% of the pupae, respectively. So we did actually find relatively good parasitism. But the parasitism that we found was almost all Leptopelina japonica. So this was not the wasp we released. Um, we released 12,000 Ganaspis brasiliensis. We recovered one at farm one, none at farm two, and seven at Wimrec. They actually, most of those came from autumn olive, which was literally the fruit that we released them in. Um, so we didn't recover a lot of Ganaspis. So Leptopelina japonica made its own way here. It is another Asian parasitoid. Um, and it is the primary wasp that's parasitizing spotted winter sofla at all the sites. It was first found in the continental, in continental North America in 2019 in British Columbia, although it may have been there since 2016. So, and it had, was found in Washington, both Ganaspis brasiliensis and Leptopelina japonica actually were found in, Wa in Washington in 2020 from their own introductions. So our efforts were not really responsible for all of that parasitism. However, these two wasps are compatible with one another. You saw that they were both infesting spotwing drosophila in Southeast Asia. Leptopelina japonica is easier to rear in the lab. So it tends to actually outperform Ganaspis brasiliensis in lab studies. Um, but Ganaspis brasiliensis was that wasp that was more common in Asia. They also use different host fruits and have slightly different lengths of how long their egg layer is. So they may be able to get spotted winged drosophila in different places. They have similar abilities to produce eggs and similar expected parasitism rates. Um, and Ganaspis brasiliensis is actually able to detect Leptopelina japonica and choose a different spotted wing to parasitize. So we think they're gonna be really useful in combination and that it is, going to be a, it is going to be worth it to continue to try to release Ganaspis brasiliensis. And overall, our goal with this biological control pro program is again, these wasps are really good at finding spotted wing drosophila. They can find them when the population is lower than you might be able to detect. They can go into the woods and find them in native host crops that we don't even know they're in. And so we're hoping that they're going to reduce the population so that it builds more slowly over the season. And this period of high pressure is pushed further back in the season. So that's our goal with this, this biological control release program. So just as a reminder, you really have to use an integrated approach for managing spotted wing drosophila. We don't, in terms of our best management best practices, there's no one silver bullet. Timely harvest and horticultural practices help. Biological control is going to be another tool in our toolbox. And we're largely still reliant on insecticides for controlling them, weekly applications of broad spectrum insecticides, especially in zero tolerance situations. Um, and we do have a few new management tactics nearing commercialization on the horizon. I mentioned some of those other biological control agents are still being researched. We also have repellents and some other behavioral management strategies like attract and kill strategies that are being developed and hopefully getting close to registration. If you want more information on spotted wing drosophila management, we, uh, here's my website. Yes, you have a question. Just, just about uh, using some of the more specific uh, lures, spotted wing drosophila lures for timing, you know, so you can find out when they first appear in, at your farm. Mm -hmm. You find that that's pretty su successful. I know Great Lakes IPM supplies one that's supposed to be more spotted wing drosophila specific. Have so you the, tried those? So the question is about monitoring spotted wing drosophila and using more specific lures. 
The more specific, the better, because you catch so many things that it's hard to find those spotted winged Drosophila in a trap. My experience with trapping has been that you will find a very small number of adults about a week before you start finding larvae in the fruit. So often I look for them in the fruit because you're gonna detect that first, especially if you're only looking. I go through them and I'll look through hundreds of bugs and find one female, and then the next week I'm finding larvae in the fruit. So, so for, maybe yes, you, that's about a week earlier. And that's the time, but they got guys and cherries a couple years ago uh -huh. and stuff like that. So it's uh, you know, thinking about using something to detect that first. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, it's interesting. So it gives you about a week, yes. And if you're going to put traps out on your, on your farm, you probably want about three per acre. Um, if you want to put them in the shade because they, are, they need um, habitat that is more conducive. And I was thinking edges too. Near yep. Near edges near the woods helps. Mm-hmm, so. mm-hmm. Okay, thank you. So if you want any other information, feel free to contact me. There's also some great, great resources on spotofwingmanagement.org, which is where the, a lot of the big national scale grow. projects on this are aggregating their information. So moving on to spotted lanternfly. Um, spotted lanternfly is another Asian pest that's recently invasive, was first detected in Berks County, Pennsylvania. It has a much longer life cycle, so it only has one generation per year. It does all of its egg laying from September to November, and it overwinters as eggs. Um, so this time of year, what you're looking for is eggs. Those eggs then hatch to nymphs in April through July. And then by late July, you're starting to see the next generation adults. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass around. So these are about one inch long. This is them with their wings spread. I'm gonna pass around some example spotted lantern flies so you can be familiar with what they look like. In terms of their seasonal life cycle, in terms of host, they will use over 70 host species. Um, this ranges all the way from vegetables, fruits and herb plants, grasses, anything, to trees. Um, and depending on the part of their life cycle, they really do have a chunk of their life cycle where they tend to prefer trees and woody plants. That's usually what the adults are feeding on. So the nymphs in May, in May and June, when they're first hatching, you may find them on roses and perennials, grape and tree of heaven, all year long. Those are the two hosts that they're really on all year long. Everything else they kind of come onto, they feed for a bit and they leave. So it's often not worth managing them on those other hosts because they're actually transitory and looking for other options. They do also seem to like red and silver maple a little bit, black walnut and butternut is another one that they seem to like. So these are the types of plants you might want to be on the lookout for them on. One of the problems with spotted lanternfly, and one of the ways that you can find them sometimes, is that the way they feed is they're piercing sucking insects. They put their mouth part in, it's like a little needle. They are sucking out plant juices. The juices that they're feeding on are really poor in protein and really high in sugars. So actually a lot of piercing sucking insects make honeydew because what they're doing is they're excreting their extra sugars and trying to concentrate the protein. So what they do is they squirt out a bunch of honeydew, and that honeydew attracts, like Chris was talking about, it attracts wasps. It causes sooty mold problems. So often what you'll see is this big kind of wasp grouping and other things going on that's coming to the honeydew, and that'll bring you in to where an aggregation of these is feeding. So here's just a video from Penn State of some spotted lantern flies feeding on a grape bunch. So I want you to zoom in here you can see, this video is sped up a little bit, but not too much. You can see them squirting that honeydew out. They are producing a lot of honeydew. So that, they're making a sticky mess. That's pretty obvious. They also feed in big groups. So they end up making this huge sticky mess underneath the trees that they're feeding in. So that's one of the problems, especially for homeowners who are facing these, these um, bugs. As I mentioned, they spend, mo the, the two hosts that they really spend a lot of their time is this invasive tree of heaven, which is native to Asia. 
one of their main host crops. Um, and then wild and cultivated grapes. They like grapes a lot. So in most crops, their feeding is going to stress the plant, but their feeding alone is not going to kill the plant. In most cases, it doesn't even cause that much damage, even though there's a huge aggregation. Because we're talking about big, healthy trees, it's usually not a huge problem. But for these crops that they're staying on for a long period of time, those are the crops. So grapes, it can cause them to be much more susceptible to winter injury. And so we have seen deaths of grapevines. So that's really the crop we're worried about spotted lanternfly in is grapes. And then they can kill tree of heaven as well. Um, the other thing is very small trees. If they're feeding on saplings, they could kill saplings. Where have we found them? So far, um, from most recent uh, reports, considered pretty infested or heavily infested are all of these counties in red. Lightly infested, sort of the front end of the invasion, invasion are these counties in yellow. And some sightings have been reported in Calvert and Worcester. Um, so we're real, the MDA is really encouraging you, if you do see spotted lanternflies, they need you to submit a picture of one, but to submit a picture and let them know, unless you're in Hartford or Cecil, because they know they're in Hartford and Cecil. That's where this invasion really, where we first got them in Maryland, was in Hartford and Cecil. But if you're in any other county and you're seeing spotted lanternfly, please reach out to the MDA. Our goal is really to help slow the spread of the invasive pest. They're going to have management responses and come out looking for those spotted lanternflies and to try to do something about them. The other piece about spotted lanternfly, because it's an invasive that we've caught early, because it grows one it only has one generation a year, we have some hope of slowing the spread. Um, there's a quarantine in place for spotted lanternfly. So what does that quarantine mean? If you're doing any kind of commercial business in any of these quarantine counties, so this is Cecil and Hartford was the first quarantine in 2019, and then it has since spread to these surrounding counties in orange, you have permit is required to move any regulated articles for within this area if you're conducting business. To get that permit, you have a two hour freeze training that you have to complete. Um, it can be done by a single representative for your operation, and then that representative can train the other members of your operation. And we have reciprocity with other states' permits. In fact, if you actually look and go through the MDA's website to get that permit, you're going to be sent to a Penn State Extension website that's providing that training. If you are not a commercial enterprise, a citizen must still use a checklist to move regulated articles from or within these counties. So citizens are, are um, asked to please use a checklist and inspect the regulated articles as well. This is the MDA checklist, which you can download online and the, for you to go through potential regulated articles that you could be moving and also shows you how to identify the different life stages of spotted lanternfly. So now let's get to what is a regulated article? What is it that I have to be worried about moving? Any life stage of the spotted lanternfly, don't move them while they're alive. I've brought you dead ones, so don't move those. The other thing is because that life cycle, they like to lay their eggs on anything hard. They'll lay them on fence posts, they'll lay them on concrete, they'll lay them on cars, they'll lay them on trailers. We think that the first ones actually came in on quarry rocks with the eggs stuck on rocks. Um, so, any plant parts, live or dead trees, nursery stock, lumber, firewood, backyard waste, mulch, all of that stuff is regulated. Outdoor industrial and construction material, equipment, concrete barriers, structures, stone, quarry materials, ornamental stone, landscaping or rewatering waste. Packing containers, wood crates and boxes. All of those are regulated articles that you need to inspect if you're a commercial you have to have a permit to move and inspect if you're a commercial enterprise and if you're a resident you need to inspect and go through the checklist other regulated articles outdoor and household articles recreational vehicles lawn tractors or mowers trucks and vehicles deck boards all that kind of stuff conveyances of any type whether utilized for movement of the materials or just moving so you need to inspect your trailers wagons any equipment attached to those things 
and any other article, product, or means of conveyance that is, when it's determined by an inspector, might be a risk of moving spot and lantern fly. So basically, Kevin, I was told by the NGA, you, know, you need a permit if you're operating a business, even if all you're doing is using your business vehicle to move from one area to another, you got to have a permit. So exactly. You have to be carrying a commodity from your farm. Nope, because the truck itself yeah. is a regulated article. Any, anything that moves and is associated with your business is a regulated article because they like to lay their eggs on like wheels and under the truck. And so you can move them. Um, so that's part of what you're going to be trained when you get this permit is how to look for them where you need to look for them to make sure that you're not moving them when you're moving within and outside the quarantine area. So right now for Spot Lantern Fly IPM, we're really focused on prevention and avoidance and monitoring and risk assessment. Let us know if you find them. Don't move, try not to move them. Let's stop the spread, slow the spread so that we have less issues with these. When it becomes time for management, is it time for management? If you're living in one of these counties that already has some infestations, maybe you've been facing spotted lanternfly, how do you decide if it's worth managing them? As I mentioned, depending on the plant species, it may or may not be causing sufficient damage to warrant management. It also may depend if you're a homeowner and they're doing this, they're attacking the tree over your car and there's honeydew everywhere. You may be really irritated. You may be frustrated it's time to get rid of that population in that specific tree. So you really have a decision based on how severe, how many of them that you have and also how worried you are about the damage that they're going to do. So if you have very few of them, they're not, and they're kind of on their favorite plants and you don't really care about the invasive tree of heaven, maybe you don't have to manage them. But maybe you have a lot of them and they're near grape vineyards or other things that you care about, then maybe you're, you're more of a high risk situation and you might want to consider doing something. What are our options? The first option we have is chemical control. Like I mentioned with spotted wing drosophila, this is often our, we usually consider in our IPM toolbox, chemical controls are our last result, resort. If nothing else is gonna work, we're gonna use chemical control to curatively kill the pest problem that we have. Unfortunately, with invasives, we don't really know enough about the way that they're gonna behave in our situation. So often chemical controls are our first resort. So we have looked at different in compounds to see how well they control spotted, wingers, uh, spotted lantern fly. We have quite a few active ingredients that are relatively effective on spotted lantern fly. They're not too bad to kill. Um, so, and they have varying toxicity to non-target organisms and varying residual activities. Largely, if you're gonna be managing them with insecticides, this is probably gonna be in a vineyard situation. So here's an aggregation. It's, their feeding can really reduce the winter hardiness of the vines um, and can, has been known to kill vines. So this is where we tend to worry about them. They also tend to come in from the edge because they're coming in from this tree of heaven and those other hosts. Um, so you tend to have more, you could potentially just be managing them on vineyard edges. There's not an economic threshold at this point. But typically a good rule of thumb is if you have about 10 spot lantern fly per vine, it's time to do something about them. And so here you can see, they're gonna, when you do something about them, you're also gonna have a lot of really obvious bugs falling off. What types of chemical controls do we have? Again, I mentioned those broad spectrum insecticides. Um, anything in the group 3As, the pyrethroid insecticides work quite well. Depending on with grapes, what, do they come in while you have clusters? Are you worried about the pre-harvest interval? Or is it after fruiting? They can actually feed it throughout September and October. So depending on the variety of grape you have, it may be while there's fruit, it may not be while there's fruit. So you wanna keep an eye on the pre-harvest interval. Usually the ones that have a longer pre-harvest interval also have a longer residual activity because those are actually tied in whether you're gonna have residue on the fruit, right? So if it's after fruit, you might want to pick something that has a longer residual activity. If it's during fruit, watch out for the pre-harvest interval. So the pyrethroids work well. The foliar and neonicotinoid insecticides, group 4A, also work well. Scorpion nectara 
Um, and then always read and follow the label instructions. Make sure the project product is registered in your crop. All of these pr products, Brigade, Danatol, Mustang, Actara, and Scorpion, do have, um, I think they're 2EE specifically for Spotted Lanternfly. So these should be registered uh, for Spotted Lanternfly. The other thing to keep in mind with Spotted Lanternfly is they're very mobile. As nymphs and adults, they tend to crawl across the ground in groups and then climb up on things. And so we'll get back to why, how that ties into management in a moment, but they can continue to move into the vineyard so you may have, for several weeks. So you may have to apply more than once to really get them. So moving on, past chemical controls, what cultural options have we developed for spotted lanternfly? One of them is at this time of year, you, if you see an egg mass, kill the egg mass. Scrape it off into alcohol. Scrape it so thoroughly that you've crushed all the eggs. Each of these egg masses could have 30 to 50 spotted lanternfly eggs. So you could be killing 30 to 50 spotted lanternflies just by removing that. Here's what the egg, egg mass looks. These are what the eggs look like. They lay them in rows if they're uncovered. Usually, after they lay them, they're going to come back and put a coating on them that protects them so that they can be safe over the winter. So they're going to put this gluey covering on over, and then it starts to weather and crack. So this is what the egg masses look like in all of their stages. Here's one on a concrete block with somebody scraping it into alcohol. Another thing that people have been recommending is using traps for the adults and nymphs, especially if you have a high value tree that you want to prevent them on. You can make a trap, a circle trap like this, where basically you've given them a little mesh funnel. And so when they try to crawl up that tree, they're crawling up that tree into a bag and dying. Or you can use a sticky trap, but if you do that, you want to make sure that you put a protective barrier over it. Otherwise, you're going to catch butterflies, pollinators, little frogs, anything else will get stuck on that stickiness. Um, but that's one way to protect specific trees is with these traps. Some other recommendations include removing the invasive tree of heaven, which is a key host for them and something that's really attractive. But you want to make sure that you're ac accurately identifying it. Staghorn sumac, black walnut, and hickory all look kind of similar, although they tend to have serrated leaves instead of smooth leaflets. Um, the other thing with Tree of Heaven is if you crush the twigs or leaves, it has a strong offensive odor. So that's a good sign that you're killing a Tree of Heaven. The other piece of this is Tree of Heavens are really hard to kill. So you're probably going to want to work with somebody about how to do that. There's some great fact sheets about how to go about killing Tree of Heaven if you want to remove this invasive Tree of Heaven from your property. This is unlikely to consistently reduce your spot lantern fly numbers, but it is an invasive pest tree. So if you want to remove it, there are resources out there to do that. The last piece is the biological control, which is what I started with, with spot, for spotted wing drosophila. Right now we have a fungus, Boveria vassiana, that's being looked at. It's not currently effective enough that it's being recommended. And there are other good bugs out there that will eat spotted lanternfly, birds and raccoons, other stuff will eat spotted lanternfly. So they're helping, but they're currently not reducing the population enough. If you'd like more inter information on spotted lanternfly, Pennsylvania was the epicenter, but also has been producing a lot of really great research. So there's the Pennsylvania State, Penn State Extension has a lot of guides. University of Maryland Extension has some stuff. And of course, the MDA website, which is also where you want to go to get the permit and to sub report any sightings if you see spotted lanternfly. So I'd like to thank my lab members, and my collaborators for this work. I'd be happy to take any questions. Did you all get a chance to look at this bug? Okay.